This is a story of two men, one you've probably heard of and one you probably haven't. Genghis Khan was from Mongolia and Chang Chun was from Shandong province in China. Chang Chun was a leading figure in the Chunjun movement of Taoism and uh, Genghis Khan united the Mongol tribes and led them on wars of conquest in China and Central Asia. One was a man of peace, the other was a man of war, and they got along splendidly. Today, the day that I'm publishing this video, is Genghis Khan Day, a national holiday in Mongolia. And in observance of this day, I want to talk a little bit about him. Uh, specifically, about a relationship he had with Chang Chun and the conversations they had together. First, a little background. Genghis Khan united the Mongol tribes, as I said, at the beginning of the 1200s and launched a war of conquest, essentially, of North China, starting in 1209. And uh, that went on for many years. After 10 years of that, in 1219, he heard that there was a Taoist monk in China named uh, Changchun that had reached the age of 300 through the means of, of Taoist practices. And so Genghis Khan summoned him to his court in Mongolia to tell him the secret of longevity. So Changchun set out to go and meet him, but meanwhile Genghis Khan launched his invasion of Central Asia so Changchun ended up having to travel all the way from uh, Shandong province all the way up through what is now Beijing up into Mongolia across Mongolia and then down through Central Asia all the way to what is now Afghanistan where Genghis Khan was camped. Changchun was accompanied by a number of other monks uh, one of them was named Li Zhichang and he wrote an account of this journey which has passed down to us in the present. It's, it was incorporated as part of the Taoist canon, and then it was translated into European languages in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, including English. Now, I love medieval travel accounts. There are a number of them. Marco Polo is the most famous one, but there are plenty of others. They're so cool because they give you this eyewitness account of a different culture. So the person who's writing the account, who's you know, like this is a foreign culture to them, and so they'll notice things that a, a native to that culture wouldn't notice. And so they'll describe lots of cool things about daily life and, and you know, what, what the animals are like, and what the food is like and stuff. I'm not going to go into all that. There's a ton of cool things um, in uh, Lee's account, but I'm not going to go into that. I'm just going to talk about this specific thing about Chang Chun in interacting with Genghis Khan. And there are three passages in particular that I want to talk about. The first one is as they're journeying to go and see Genghis Khan, they pass a city called Balch. And what happened was uh, Genghis Khan had uh, come in and invaded that area in 1219-1220 and he, he took over the city of Balch in 1220, but at, at first the, pity, the people of Balch had submitted willingly to Genghis Khan's rule and so he let them all live and just pay taxes, right? But then he left the area to go and pursue Jalal ad the heir to the Khwarezmian throne. And um, while he was away, the people of Balkh thought that it would be a good idea to rebel from Mongol rule. So Genghis Khan came back in 1222 and killed every man, woman, and child in the city. Now, just a few weeks later, Chang Chun and his fellow monks passed by that area on the way to see Genghis Khan. Uh, so the, the account says, we followed the river upstream and then went southeast for 30 li. Lack of water now compelled us to travel by night. We passed the great city of Balch. Its inhabitants had recently rebelled against the Khan and been removed, but we could still hear dogs barking in its streets. Now, when Lee says had been removed, he's using a euphemism. They were all killed. Uh, but I find this account really eerie. Um, I don't know if that's the right word, but I think you know what I mean. Like, they, they were traveling along. They passed by this big city. It was a pretty big city at the time. And there were no people. It was completely depopulated. And there weren't farmers going back and forth from the fields to the city uh, to sell their vegetables. There weren't merchants from other cities traveling in because there's no one to sell anything to now. There were no sounds of marketplaces inside the city or people bustling on the streets. 
No, it was silent. And the city was just full of corpses. But I find it so, like, what a, what a chilling detail for Lee to put in there. But we could still hear dogs barking in its streets. And I love this detail. I don't love what it's portraying, but I love that we, we, we're we getting here an eyewitness account. Lee was there and he saw it. So in a sense, we're only just one step removed from seeing that ourselves. We're only hearing it through the mediation of one person, Lee. And it makes the devastation and the death that accompanied the Mongol conquest so much more real. It's one thing to read in a book, oh, they went around killing lots of people. It's another thing to read an eyewitness account of what it was like to travel in areas that the Mongols had recently gone through. Changchun reached Genghis Khan's camp and they're they're talking. Genghis Khan loved to have him over for conversation. And the night before there had been a snowstorm that had knocked out a pontoon bridge. And so Genghis Khan asked the reason of calamities such as earthquakes, thunder, and so on. And the master Changchun replied, I have heard that in order to avoid the wrath of heaven, you forbid your countrymen to bathe in rivers during the summer, wash their clothes, make fresh felt, or gather mushrooms in the fields. And he goes on. Now, the subtext here, which Lee doesn't come right out and say, but is kind of understood for a contemporary. When the Mongols forbade people from washing in the rivers, that means that if they caught you going into the river to wash, they would kill you on the spot. Uh, because of that was a taboo in the Mongol um, like religious system. Now that was a problem if you were a Muslim who had come under Mongol rule, because Muslims, of course, do washings. They do ritual washings before prayers, and in Central Asia they would very often just go down to the local stream or river to do the washings. Uh, but if a Mongol saw them doing that, they would go over there and strike them down and kill them. And there are accounts, not in this account, but there are accounts in other um, like historical works from the period, particularly from Muslim writers, that talk about it was not uncommon for Muslims to be killed by Mongols in this way. Um, but here, um, the master, Ch uh, Changchun, is kind of gently reprimanding Genghis Khan. I mean, he, he says further down, now, in this respect, I believe your subjects to be gravely at fault, and it would be well if your majesty would use your influence to reform them. Uh, and then Genghis Khan replied, Holy immortal, your words are exceedingly true. Such is indeed my own belief. And he bade those who were present to write them down in Uyghur characters, meaning in, in Mongolian. The master asked, Master Changchun, asked, that what he had said might be made known to the Khan subjects in general, and this was agreed to. Now, nothing changed. Mongol behavior didn't change. So I don't know exactly what was happening here. Was Genghis Khan just humoring Changchun? Uh, did he really have some genuine intent to change his ways? I doubt that. Uh, there might also be uh, an element of some stuff is being lost in translation because um, none of them spoke the other language. Changchun and Li did not speak Mongolian. Genghis Khan spoke a little bit of Chinese, probably, um, but he wasn't fluent. But anyway, um, for whatever reason, uh, the Mongols did not end up implementing Changchun's advice. Uh, one other episode that I want to talk about is when Genghis Khan went on a boar hunt the Khan went hunting in the mountains to the east. He shot a boar, but at this moment his horse stumbled and he fell to the ground. Instead of rushing upon him, the boar stood perfectly still, apparently afraid to approach. And then Genghis Khan's retainers came and got his horse and brought it back, and Genghis Khan got on the horse and they went on their way. And then, um, hearing of this incident, Chang Chun reproached Genghis Khan, telling him that in the eyes of heaven, life was a precious thing. Imagine saying that to Genghis Khan. The Khan was now well on in years and should go hunting as seldom as possible. His fall, the master pointed out, had been a warning. 
just as the failure of the boar to advance and gore him had been due to the intervention of heaven. And then Genghis Khan replied, I know quite well that your advice is extremely good, but unfortunately we Mongols are brought up from childhood to shoot arrows and ride. Such a habit is not easy to lay aside. However, this time I have taken your words to heart. Then turning to Kishlik Darkhan, which was one of Genghis Khan's associates, uh, Genghis Khan said, in future I shall do exactly as the holy immortal advises. And then Lee adds at the end, it was indeed two months before he again went hunting, which um, uh, anyway, I, you know, I might be reading a little bit into it, but I, I feel like Lee is taking a very gentle, subtle jab at Genghis Khan by putting it that way. Um, uh, but what you have here, and kind of what I, the, the little aspects of Lee's account that I wanted to pull out and, and can talk about a little bit, was you've got these two individuals that are diametrically opposed in their philosophies of life, right? And, but they get along with each other. I mean, we don't really find out what Chang Chun thinks of Genghis Khan, but it really comes through in here that Genghis Khan thinks a lot of Chang Chun. Um, which, um, again, I mean, Lee's writing a hagiography. Um, then the whole point of this work is to talk about how awesome Chang Chun is, and how holy he is, how much everybody loves him and respects him. So. I don't know, you can probably take that with a grain of salt. But, I mean, looking at other historical sources, we, we can get a reliable picture that Genghis Khan had a lot of respect for holy men of whatever religion. Um, you know, but at the same time, no matter how much respect Genghis Khan had for Chang Chun, he was not going to change his ways. And the Mongols were not going to change their ways. On those occasions when he talks to Genghis Khan about violence, I get the impression he's trying to gently nudge Genghis Khan toward a more peaceful way of life and failing because Genghis Khan is set in his ways as he comes out and says. So uh, my, my takeaway here is first of all, just happy Genghis Khan day. And um, let's remember his contributions, so to speak, to world history but also, um, I mean, I think it's kind of telling that we've heard of Genghis Khan, or at least many of us have, but not many of us have heard of Chang Chun. And I think that says something about, uh, maybe it says a little bit about what we care to emphasize in world history, what aspects of history we care to talk about versus the kinds of the parts of world history we tend to ignore. Uh, there might be some of that going on. Uh, but also, I think there's there's kind of this aspect of, like, how are we remembering the Middle Ages? Oftentimes, we tend to think of the Middle Ages as a very violent time. And of course, it was violent, but I would argue no more or less violent than any other period of human history, including now. Um, but I, I, I suspect that many of us don't take into account that there were people in the Middle Ages who had um, moral standards and had principles and were virtuous. Uh, there were people at the time of Genghis Khan's wars who believed that what he was doing was morally wrong. Not just the people on the receiving end of a Mongol arrow, um, but also people who were on the sidelines who were not directly affected by the violence saw what was happening and said that's wrong and then Chang Chun was in a position to speak essentially speak truth to power now, he was not really in danger in personal danger there was no way that Genghis Khan was going to punish him no matter what he said because he had just too much reverence for his holiness but um, he was coming from a position of not having any military or political power coming into the presence of this conqueror and telling him to his face, perhaps in euphemistic terms, perhaps in somewhat polite terms, but telling him, look, what you're doing is wrong. And I think it's worth remembering that also, not just remembering the conquerors in history, but also remembering the peacemakers. 
Uh, but that's all I wanted to talk about today. Happy Genghis Khan Day. <laughs> and uh, thanks for watching.